Welcome everyone. Good morning. It's a wonderful day here at the new church at Boynton Beach. Today we're going to have a service that will give us occasion to reflect upon the Lord and his wonderful love for all of us. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Amen. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. O oh Lord, my God, I cried out to you, and you healed me. O oh Lord, you brought up my soul from the grave. You have kept me alive, that I should not go down to the pit. For your anger is but for a moment. Your favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. I cried out to you, O Lord, and to the Lord I made supplication. Hear, O Lord, and have mercy on me. Lord, be my helper. You have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have put off my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness to the end that my glory may sing praise to you and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. Amen. O Jesus Christ, our Lord, we kneel before you with our humble ritual as we acknowledge that you are the source of all life and all wisdom and all love. O Lord, may we receive these gifts from you that we may honor you through our words and deeds. Amen. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Make your face shine upon your servant. Save me for your mercy's sake. You may rise. Glory be to the Lord God, our Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Let us now turn to number 456 for our recitation. It's taken from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 25, verse 9. Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Amen. You may be seated. So today we're going to read a psalm, a most wonderful psalm, psalm number eight. And we know that these psalms were written by David, who was a shepherd boy. 
And we can imagine him during countless hours sitting, waiting, perhaps under the cool of a, the shade of a tree, playing his harp, practicing his notes, writing, reflecting, sharing his thoughts about God, life, and the salvation that comes from on high. Well, when we read the Psalms, we too can have our thoughts raised up where we think of the Lord. So here are these words. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens. Isn't it wonderful to look at the sky during almost any hour of the day and wonder at the clouds, their shapes, their movement, the blue sky, sometimes dark clouds. We can anticipate the coming of a storm. And here above the clouds, above the heavens, we contemplate the glory of God. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because we are enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. Think of what comes from the mouth of little babes. Their sweet sounds, their noises, their simple conversation. What a delight that is. And we have a sense that with the innocence of children, it's like our spiritual enemies are just sent away because they can have no home, no place in the sphere of little children. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, how wonderful it is to look at the stars at night and think of how small we are in compa comparison to the vastness of the universe. How big is the Lord? Well, he is so great that he's beyond comprehension. He presents himself to us as a man because he was born, Jesus Christ, so that we might know our God. But we know that within him is this greatness, the glory of God. So what is man? You are mindful of him. Who are we, human beings? Do we deserve any of this wonder and blessing of this world? Well, in a sense, no. But in another sense, the Lord created all this for us because he sees each one of us as special. The Lord loves us so tenderly like a mother loves her little child. For you, the Lord, have made him a little lower than the angels and have crowned him with glory and honor. Yes, we live in this realm below the angels, but our day will come where the Lord will lift us up to be with the angels. That's the cycle of life. All sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. The Lord is most excellent. And the Lord has given us these psalms that we might reflect on him, that we might, might have a reason to turn to the Lord in his word. Amen. We will have a blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. Amen. We turn next to the book of John, near the end of that gospel, some verses from chapter 21. Then Jesus comes. The third time already Jesus was manifested to his disciples being risen from the dead. When they had dined, Jesus says to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me more than these? He says to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He says to him, feed 
my lambs. We now turn to the heavenly doctrine and read from the work True Christian Religion, number 43, on the subject of love. It is the essence of love to love others outside of oneself, to desire to be one with them, and to render them blessed from oneself. The essence of God consists of two things, love and wisdom. While the essence of his love consists of three things, namely, to love others outside of himself, to desire to be one with them, and from himself to render them blessed. Because love and wisdom in God make one, as has been shown above, the same three things constitute the essence of his wisdom. And love desires these three things, and wisdom brings them forth. For as God is love itself, so is he blessedness itself. For all love breathes forth delight from itself, and the divine love breathes forth blessedness itself, happiness and felicity to eternity. Thus God from himself renders the angels blessed, and men after death, and this he does by conjunction with them. Amen. Here end the lessons. Blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. Amen. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God is love. That's one of the messages that we read from True Christian Religion number 43. One of the great truths of religion is that God is love. This idea is taught nearly everywhere. We seem to know it instinctively. Even people who do not know what to think about God or organized religion may still have a sense of a universal force for good which is love, infinite love. So is not this our message also that God is love? The new church teaches quite specifically that human beings have an inbuilt disposition to recognize the reality and nature of their creator. And so the teaching is, this is found in true Christian religion number eight, there is an influx into the souls of men of the truth that there is a God and that he is one. It's a little bit like the instinct that a child has to be joined to its mother, to love his or her parents. God is love, love itself. That love is infinitely wise. We read as a lesson today that outlines the most helpful and once considered the most obvious definition of love. And of course, we're speaking of true love and not merely trivial likes or outward attachments that may serve for momentary pleasure, perhaps for good or perhaps for bad. True love is that inward energy that from its nature looks to others outside of self to be joined with those others and thirdly to render them happy or blessed so that's it that's love love is outgoing it looks to the blessings of others and desires those others to be near we know this nature of love from our own experience the people we are drawn especially close to are those we love. And 
when we see someone we especially love come into our presence, we experience a kind of energy, a sense of perhaps even excitement. And we delight when we see them happy. And we feel glad when we play some part, even if it's a small part, in bringing them some pleasure or joy. And especially if that joy is of a lasting nature. Now consider that is, this is how we experience love, what love must be in the Lord's case. After all, that's where all love originates. His love is infinite. Not that we can ever really comprehend what that is. But when we look at the stars at night and contemplate the size and scope, the depth of the universe, we, we have a little bit of a clue of the extent of the Lord's love. So what exists in God is what may be received in some measure by us. And so this is the reason we are here. This is how we got to be in the first place, as the Lord has fashioned us in our mother's wombs. The word from beginning to end is a testament to the truth that God is love. We open the pages of scripture and from the story of creation, Adam and Eve in Genesis, to the final pages of the book of Revelation, we see the holy city as a bride descending from God out of heaven. We see and discover and we may confirm that God is all wise and that his wisdom is ever an expression of his love for each one of us. The evidence of the Lord's love in the word is a reality, but it may not always seem so. Consider that even in scripture, things are not always as they seem. And so we recognize that the word in its letter when misunderstood, may be used to kill its true spirit that lies within it. And so think about how the word is written in appearances. Appearances. What does that mean? Well, doesn't the sun appear to rise in the east? And yet we have a different concept of the relationship between the earth and the sun. Perhaps it doesn't actually rise in the east, but the earth is spinning in such a way as we are approaching the east in the morning. So the sun seems to rise. So is this not also true for the Lord's word? It sometimes appears that God is angry, or it is said that God has been vengeful towards his enemies. But such occurrence are, occurrences are expressed in terms of the way it often seems from a human perspective, from man's point of view. And especially is this the case when man pushes away from God and removes himself from the true order of life. And what is that true order of life? that helps us see beyond the appearance to the reality that is within the word. Is it not that of mercy and of service towards our neighbor? And so the Holy Scripture may here and there seem to hide the loving nature of our Heavenly Father. Yet on the other hand, he makes sure that enough in the word is plainly said so as to leave little doubt of his true character and from those places where the message is clear we can find a way to interpret aright those passages which may appear to contradict so we read in the psalms when i see your heavens the work of your fingers the moon and the stars which you have established what is man that you remember him and the son of man that you visit him you have made him a little lower than the angels and have crowned him with glory and honor. O oh Lord, our Lord, how magnificent.
magnificent is your name in all the earth. So is it not unmistakable that the Lord put us here because we are at the very center of the divine plan. We as human beings, fashioned from his love by means of his infinite wisdom. So we truly say how magnificent is his name in all the earth. And we read in the Psalms, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits who pardons all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the ditch, who crowns you with mercy and compassions, who satisfies your mouth with good so that your youth may renew itself as the eagle. Compassionate and gracious is the Lord, slow to anger and great in mercy. Such a passage shows us the nature of the Lord's love. There is the proverbial clockmaker who winds up the clock to then, then sit back and watch it run, tick. So some might imagine that this is how God has created the universe. But it is not so. The Lord did not make us and then just sit back leaving us all to ourselves to see what might become of us. His love is connecting. It is sensitive. He senses what is going on in the lives of each of us. And his love is guiding because his wisdom is at work. It is created even moment by moment. The divine love reaches out to save people so that each one of us might share in his love and partake of his blessings. Now, we should not expect the workings of God's love to be so obvious that we cannot escape the sensation of God's love. For he leaves us in a state where we are free to receive his love or not, to see it or not. So the truth is that we can be on the lookout for it, and if we look for it, perhaps we will see it. We read in the work True Christian Religion, again, returning to that work, this is in number 766, that the Lord is continually present with man, urging and pressing to be received. It's that picture of the Lord standing at the door and knocking. He is there. All we have to do is listen, open the door, and then we can join with him and sup with him. So think of the Lord's love not just as an inanimate force, but as the active working of someone who loves us. Can there be any soul on earth who is left untouched by the Creator's compassion and mercy? Is there any heart among us where the Lord is not continually renewing what is in us that we might be lifted up, that our eyes might be opened and restored with a youthful zest for life? The Lord knows our frame. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our tendencies to go astray. He fashioned us from the dust of the ground. He knows more than we will ever realize of those things that are the obstacles to our spiritual life. So we turn to the New Testament where Jesus declares, are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Fear not, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And we recall that moment when Jesus was looking over Jerusalem, knowing that shortly he would be, be crucified at the hands of evil men. And he cried out, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who were sent to you, 
How often I would gather your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. And ye would not. Even in the face of the harshness of the human heart, the Lord reaches out in love to each person. And so what an amazing example this is of the Lord's merciful love. And so we hear him declare even on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So the Lord's love is infinite and merciful. His love is ready to save all who are willing to receive it. And for those who reject his love, he provides a place removed where they are with others like themselves. Well, what are we speaking of here? The Lord doesn't ever force himself upon those who are determined to turn away and to live their own life separate from God. So they enter a state, we call this place, spiritual place, hell, a state where such are surrounded by a merciful order that works to limit the ill effects of the evil that they have embraced in their hearts. Where the Lord works to prevent, to the extent possible, any unnecessary, unnecessary suffering that they would bring upon themselves and their companions. the suffering is not inflicted by God in an act of vengeance. It's simply that the evil they embrace brings about those consequences that are hurtful to themselves and others. So when we think about the Lord's love, we can see that this is what the Lord wishes to save us from. And we might be content simply to imagine all the good things, the wonderful things he does for us. He gives us our life. He surrounds us with friends and family. He puts us in a world filled with wonder and beauty, the stars of the sky. And if we think about it, we can stop there. And we might imagine that we are all created simply to bask in the warmth of the Lord's love as bathers do in the sunshine to sit away and while away the hours of existence. But that would be a picture of an inactive life, a life of idleness. The Lord wants us at times to be quiet, to be still, to have a time of rest where we reflect where we are renewed. But really, we're to enter a state of love which is active, as the Lord's love is active towards us. What if we enjoy the love of others, but if, what happens if we care little to do anything for them in return? This doesn't, this doesn't mean that the Lord's love demands a return from us. This is not what this is about. That wouldn't be love. The Lord offers his love, and if we're awake to what's happening, we can, we can re return that love as if of ourselves, but from the power and strength that the Lord gives us. Then we can experience a love that flows not only in one direction, but in two directions. And that's where this connection part of love takes place to be near those we love the Lord wishes to be near us and the Lord's love is really complete when we return his love so this is where we go to the story late in the book of John where the Lord engages Peter in this conversation asking him questions do you love me well Peter is the one who is an expression of the Lord's, uh, of the, of the response of the human mind to have faith in the Lord. Peter is the one who expressed to the Lord, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, 
Upon this, I will build my church, this faith, this acknowledgement. Peter is the one who, in an act of faith, stepped out of the boat and walked on the water to go to Jesus. So Peter represents this faith, this, this, we might say this confidence that we can do what the Lord wants us to do. But what if we just stop with that sense of confidence without the following through of the doing of the things the Lord wants us to do? Well then, like Peter, we'll begin to sink into the water and the Lord has to rescue us by reaching out his hand. So in this conversation, in the end of Gospel of John, Jesus asks Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, do you love me more than these? He says to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus says to him, feed my lambs. And three times the Lord asks him, do you love me? And the third time, Peter expresses anguish because the Lord keeps repeating the question. And he says to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus says once again, feed my sheep. So we may have a faith. We may have a belief. We may have a knowing of the things of the Lord. But if the Lord's love is to be complete, then we must return the Lord's love to him. And how do we do that? Feed my sheep. So in whatever work or calling we have, will we not be tested even as the Lord was testing Peter? And is not the Lord asking us to consider his lambs, his sheep? To awaken to the sheep who are around you. You are part of a flock. You are one of the many keepers of your brethren. They need you. People around you need your tending and your care. So you see, our Lord is inquiring of faithfulness, represented by Peter, whether our faithfulness is joined with love whether our faith has been transformed by its devotion to charity and to the works of mutual love. By this shall all know that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. And the Lord says every tree is known by its fruit. What fruit do we bear? And the Lord says, in a parable, inasmuch as you have done this unto the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. So, round about us is a world filled with people. We have people close to us, we have spouse and family. There's a church society around us. We are members of different communities, different spheres of influence. And there are seekers and sinners in every community of which we are a part. And the challenge is to see them not just as so many people around us cluttering our world, perhaps being annoyance when they cross us or get in our way, but to see others as the Lord sees them to the extent we are able. We can reflect upon the Lord's love and ask ourselves, how do we love the Lord in return. In reply, the Lord directs us towards his lamb, his lambs, and his sheep. There are so many ways we might learn of the Lord's love for us. Indeed, there are many scriptures that teach about this subject. We've only mentioned a few of them. But let us be assured that the Lord's love is real. It is continually pressing and urging to be received. And the world is a much better place to the extent that each of us and all of us together receive that love into our lives. Now at the end of John's Gospel, we read, 
these curious words about all the deeds of Jesus. Remember his deeds are his words, the acts of his love. But there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if every one of them should be written, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. There is a question for us to ponder as we close our talk today. If God is love, what would that look like when written into our book of life. Amen. Please rise. going out and you're coming in from this time forth and even forevermore.